Hello and welcome to DIG School, cross-curricular learning themed around archaeology. This session is Call My Bluff and we'll be looking at interpreting objects from the past and thinking about how to get closer to the truth. Key questions will be what can we learn from artefacts from the past? What is context and why does this matter? Firstly, have a look at this object and write down in your workbook everything you can say about it that describes it. Well, now you've had a chance to do that. Have a look at the next slide. Where there's some other sources about this object? There's a couple of pictures and there's some text. So have a look at the pictures, read the text, and then look carefully at all three images and now write another description of what you think that strange round object that I showed you first might have been. So I'll give you as much time as you want to do that. So now you've had a chance to look at that object. What, what, what thoughts did you come up with? Well, you read that source describing a particular uh, series of activities that were carried out um, uh, as part of sacrifices to a girl called Shippe Totek. You can see from the caption on the big statue that this is uh, Shippe Totek. Uh, this statue dates to about 1500 AD and it comes from Mexico. Um, and if you look very carefully, at the uh, attribution to the quote, you'd have seen the word Aztecs there. So that might have given you a few hints. But just reading through that description, uh, talking about the sacrificial victim, uh, having their heart removed, then the skin removed, and then the priests wore the skin for 20 days during a series of fertility rituals, and that then that really rather unpleasant by then skin, uh, was put in a sealed container, a tightly sealed container, and then that container was buried in the temple dedicated to Shippe Totek. So I wonder if you concluded that that round object was a container for one of those skins. And if you did that, you'd have been absolutely right, because that's what this container is. As you've just seen, if you'd look carefully at the scale on the first slide I showed you, you can see it's quite large. Um, and the reason it's bobbly on the outside is the same reason that the statue of Shippe Totek, the standing statue there, is also blobby on the outside. It's actually representing the inside of a human skin uh, with all the fat on it when it's been turned inside out and has been worn as a costume. And in fact, on the smaller inset statue there, you can actually see another image of this same god, Shippe Totek, shown from behind with the laces that are doing up this costume that the priest would have been wearing, and which might even have been draped over a statue of Shippe Totek. This all sounds horrendously gruesome, and of course it is. But it was actually part of the Aztec belief system uh, who believed their gods had shed their own blood to create the world and create human life. Therefore, they owed it to give that blood, human blood, back to the gods if they were going to get favourable harvests or uh, children born healthily or win their wars. So it wasn't mindless cruelty. There was a logic to it though not one we'd want to uh, advocate today. But it does show you how much information is tied up in one artefact, but also how much you need that sort of contextual information to be able to understand that artefact. It's very difficult to infer that, all of that story, from just looking at the object, however closely you look at the object, and even realising that its appearance, that blobby appearance, is actually a clue to its use. You need to have some knowledge to be able to put that clue together. 
So artifacts contain a lot of information about societies been in the past, but you can get misled. Now, this artifact probably looks a bit more familiar. Does anyone know what it is? Yep, probably. I expect you mostly did. Um, it came from an archaeological excavation in a garden in the UK. Um, and I think we'd all uh, be fairly confident in identifying it as a bath plug or a sink plug. Um, even if it's not exactly the same as the ones we have in our homes, we know enough about 21st century life to be fairly confident that that's probably what it is. And you might not think you could come up with any other possible explanation. So I'm going to just take you through one of my favourite books written about archaeology uh, called Motel of the Mysteries. The idea behind it is set up in the introduction to this brilliant book by David McCauley, um, where he imagines that it's a couple of thousand years into the future, the ancient country of Yuza, spelt U-S-A, you think where that might have been? has been buried under feet of detritus, and all knowledge of the society, or much knowledge of the society has been lost. Um, an archeologist, amateur archeologist, uh, stumbles across uh, an old, previously excavated site, falls down a hole in the ground and discovers himself in front of a doorway where there's a sign uh, which he interprets as sealing the doorway. It says, do not disturb on it. Um, he thinks this is the entrance to a still sealed burial chamber. Uh, it, uh, it then goes on to say he discovers these two amazing bodies, one on a ceremonial bed facing an altar, the other in a, a porcelain chamber, um, a sarcophagus. Um, and from that, he pieced together the civilization. Now, you might have guessed what it is is actually discovered from the name of the title and perhaps some of the words and perhaps that sign on the door. But this book imagines that this archaeologist, this amateur archaeologist, is thinking of this site as if it is like Tutankhamun's tomb or an ancient pyramid. He thinks it's an amazing ceremonial funerary complex when actually that's what the site looked like when he'd fully excavated it. Uh, only one of those cells still had a roof on it. You can see it at the top of the picture. All of the others, uh, the roof had gone, everything inside it had rotted away or been destroyed over time. Um, but perhaps you can see from that plan that it's a motel style hotel. People drive up to their cars, park outside. There's a swimming pool at the back and there's each of these identical rooms with a little ensuite bathroom. But he goes through into this chamber in this book and sees this uh, skeleton on what he interprets as a ceremonial bed looking uh, in front of him at what he interprets as a uh, some kind of a device for altar for communicating with the gods because he's so fixed on that and then goes into the inner chamber and discovers another skeleton lying in this porcelain sarcophagus. And because he thinks this is a tomb, he interprets all of the objects in that sort of way. So he takes the seat from the loo and sees this as a headdress, which would have been worn in the way you can see in this picture. The toothbrushes are interpreted as ceremonial earrings and other items around the bathroom are interpreted in a similar way, including, of course, that object we were looking at a little bit earlier, the bath plug, which he interprets as a sacred pendant. And you can see this description here. This exquisite piece of jewellery, he says, was found lodged in a silver rimmed hole in the floor of the sarcophagus where it had apparently been dropped. He doesn't make the connection that the perfect fit suggests it might have been designed to go in there. The beautiful pendant, he says, was carved out of rubber, now petrified, turned to stone over time, and has been inscribed with the markings one and a half. It is connected most delicately by silver ring to a beautifully formed silver chain. 
the symbolic derivation of pendant's form has yet to be determined, he says pompously. We don't know why it looked like that, but it clearly has symbolic meaning. Now, this all seems absolutely bonkers when we're reading it through, but the whole book is a very amusing story about how easy it can be to get things wrong if you're thinking about things the wrong way. It's also easy to get things wrong if you haven't seen an artefact before or if you don't know anything about where it came from. And that's, well, both of those are problems that we all face when looking at stuff from the past. We can get wrong ideas in our heads or we can simply see stuff that we don't know about or haven't seen before and can't find anything out about. So for the next few slides, get into groups, have a look at each image I'm going to show you and the accompanying three interpretations and in your groups decide which one you think is true. When you've decided You'll see the answers and you can give yourselves one point for each correct guess. See which team gets the most points. So keep your discussions quiet if you're working in groups. So this is the first object and you can see the three descriptions there. So I'll give you as much time as you want to have a read through of them, have a discussion among yourselves and you agree whether you think it's number one, number two or number three. That's the correct description. Okay, so having had a chance to make a guess and write down your answer, which one did you go for, I wonder? Well, if you went for number three, you were correct. It is actually a little model of a Spitfire aeroplane made from an old pre-decimalization one penny coin as a popular children's toy, possibly even used as a brooch. So well done if you got that right. This is the next artifact. And again, there are three explanations. So I'll give you a bit of time to have a look, decide which of those three you think is the right one. Okay, so you've had time to make your guess and write down your answer. So I wonder which, which one you went for. So if you went for number three, then you were right. It is a Bronze Age battle axe. Um, it may have been for ceremonial use. It's a big, heavy old thing. It could even have been for sacrificial use. We really don't know. But there's a large chip out of the pointed end, which does suggest it's been used in some sort of real uh, activity, whether that's battle or whether that's some sort of sacrifice. Um, it's certainly not just a ceremonial symbol of office. Um, it would have taken a lot of working. That's hard stone. Uh, that hole would have had to be pecked away with a small hammer stone. And the shape around the edge, again, would have to be crafted and smoothed with a hammerstone. That's hours and hours and hours of work, so it's an important item. Okay, this is the next object, and again, there are three explanations. Have a look at those and write down which one you think is the correct answer. Okay, so now you've had a chance to write down your correct answer. Let's see who got this one right. Well, if you went for explanation number three, it's indeed a 17th century gun flint. Uh, if you hit flint with iron, it will create a spark inside a, an early rifle. Uh, this would have created an explosion which would have forced uh, the lead uh, bullet out of the rifle. You can see the little notch at the bottom. That's where the iron has struck repeatedly against the flint, worn it away so that it no longer reaches, at which point you'd have thrown away the flint and made yourself another one. And if you got that right. OK, this is the next object. Again, there are three explanations. So have a read through, have a discussion, have a think, and then write down which one you think is the correct explanation.
Okay, so which explanation did you think was the correct one here? Well, if you went for the first one, that was the correct explanation. It is in fact an Iron Age comb uh, made from a cow's foot bone. Um, it's not for combing hair, we don't think it's for weaving. An incredibly important way of making clothing and fabric um, in that period. And it's used for sort of tamping down the uh, threads as you weave them between the upright threads and tamping them down to make the uh, cloth as solid and therefore as durable as possible. So well done if you got that one. So here's the next one. Um, and again, three explanations. Have a look, have a think, write down which explanation you think is the right one. Okay, so you've written down which explanation you think is right for this one. And in this case, it is indeed the Roman small glass fragments, probably from a mosaic where they're doing the little detailed bits. Um, there are not many mosaics that are this exotic in this country, but certainly there are a lot more uh, in countries around the Mediterranean. Um, but it's possible that the one in the top middle is actually from something different from a ring. Bit of a strange collection of bits and pieces. Here's the next object. Um, again, have a look at the explanations, write down which one you think is the true explanation. Okay, so having written down uh, your answers, your correct answers, or the ones you think are the correct answers, let's see who's got that right. And this time it's explanation number two. It's actually a Victorian straw splitter. Um, comes from Hertfordshire. Uh, these were used to split straws um, when the uh, crop had been harvested and the corn had been threshed. Uh, the straw is just waste. The straw being the stems is just waste. Um, but actually it could be made into straw hats, which became terribly fashionable in the middle and later Victorian period. And that straw hatting industry was a major source of additional income for many rural families. And that's what this was. It would have had a wooden handle on it when it was in use. So next object is this one here. Again, have a look at the explanations, see which one you think. Okay, so which one did you go for? Well, if you went for the second one, it is indeed a three or four thousand year old bronze axe from Hungary. The curved sides are designed to hold the wooden handle in position, uh, which would enable it to be used efficiently uh, to cut down trees and prepare timber uh, for whatever purpose it was wanted for. So well done if you got that right. And then here's the last object for this section. Uh, have a look at this one and see if you can get this one right. Okay, so having had a few minutes to think about that, which one is the right answer? Well, in this case, it is the early 20th century container for eye makeup effectively, still very widely used. Uh, the lid unscrews, uh, the wand uh, it then comes out with the coal, the black powder all over it, which you can then use uh, to uh, put around your eyes to accentuate them. So how did you get on? Um, I hope you had fun doing this. I hope it gave you the chance to think quite critically about what sort of explanation might be true, what might not be true and how to question what you're reading, and then think about what might make sense as an explanation. And again, most of these may have been objects you've never seen before, and this is often what we're faced with as archeologists, finding stuff that we haven't seen before. So that's the end of part one. If you want to have a short break now, um, I'll see you a bit later. Okay, for part two of Call My Bluff, we'll switch around a little bit. So you've had a go at trying to identify true from false explanations. You've seen the range of sort of explanations that you might be able to offer. And I think most of those ones we had in those previous eight slides, any of them perhaps could have been right. 
and many of them are based on true information. Marco Polo did bring back the recipe for pasta from the Far East, although it has been suggested it had been used in varying forms for quite a long time before that. So there are hints of truth, and that's often a way to make a false explanation sound convincing. So you now have a chance to write your own false explanations. So for this, uh, get into teams or work on your own if you prefer. Um, write your own interpretations looking at the object. Your teacher can then show you the correct explanation. And then write two false interpretations. Now, if there's several of you in different groups, take it in turn for one group to know what the true explanation is and write the false explanations, and the other groups to watch and guess. Once you're all ready, take it in turns to read out all three explanations and guess which ones are true. So I'll just show you the pictures for now. And you can stop the video at each picture, decide who's going to write the true and false explanations. Um, you can play backwards and forwards through and have a look at all the pictures. Enjoy. Okay, so I hope you've had fun with that. Um, you've probably found out the correct answers, but just in case you've played it a bit differently, um, I'll just go through the answers and also just in case there's been any uh, disagreements about them. Um, so going through them, that first one, the correct answer in fact is it is a, a wooden headrest from Eastern Africa. Um, it's a pillow effectively that had gone under the back of the neck to protect ornately sort of waxed and set hairstyles uh, from getting messed up while people are sleeping. It's almost impossible to believe you could sleep comfortably like that. But that's what it's for. And these elaborate hairstyles were part of uh, people's identity that communicated their status and things about the sort of person they were. Uh, so that's what that object was for. This object is the lid of a medieval pyx dating to maybe 1350 to 1400, just after the Black Death perhaps. Um, it's used uh, for holding communion wafers, so there'd have been a little pot underneath it, and this is the lid that would have sat on top of that. Um, communion wafer is given out during Christian religious services, and you can see on this pix there's a little hinge at one side and a little clip that would have been used to shut the object uh, on the other side. Um, it's clearly seen a lot of use because the holes are quite worn, um, and it's also rather more elaborate than we'd normally expect from a parish church. It's very similar to examples made at places like Limoges in France. Um, it's unusual to find an object like this. They weren't generally thrown away because um, even uh, after they'd gone out of use, they were still considered to be holy, uh, possible, perhaps it was stolen even. This is a really sweet object with three rabbits on it. Uh, this is actually a copper alloy, alloy trade token uh, dated uh, to the 17th century. It's valued at half a penny. It's actually made at a time when 
normal coins had to have the value of metal in them. So a silver penny had to have a penny's worth of silver in it. Um, and there was a huge shortage of metal. So there was a huge shortage of small change. Um, and uh, so people started issuing their own small change. This was issued by uh, Robert Pearson uh, in Kingston. He ran a pub called the Three Conies. A cony is a word for rabbit. So that's his small change. Um, with the three rabbits and it says his half penny on it uh, with his name. It meant if you'd spent some money at his inn and he'd given you some change, then you could come back and spend that again at his pub. So I wonder what you made of this item. Um, it's actually a copper alloy open thimble uh, used to protect your fingers while you're sewing cloth. The needles are very pointed, they have to be at both ends to go through the cloth without damaging it. That can prick your fingers, so this is to protect your fingers. The outer face has little dots in it to help stop the needle slip around the surface of the thimble. Um, uh, it has no top to it. Usually in thimbles today, there's a top to it. Um, but actually, because you're using the side of your uh, finger to push the needle through the thread, you don't really need a top. OK, this is a different item again. The correct explanation for that is that it's an Anglo-Saxon cruciform brooch called cruciform because it's in the form of a cross with a long low shaft and then a cross piece and a uh, top at, at the top. Um, the lower end actually is made to resemble a horse with its sort of flared nose, uh, the uh, flared nostrils, the sort of bridge of its nose and then going up uh, towards its eyes. Um, so there's a combination of sort of Christian iconography, Christian images, and sort of rather more uh, traditional pagan images with animals in incorporated into the design. We don't know where this one came from, but where they are found in graves, they're generally at the shoulders, um, and we think they're used for either holding uh, sort of a bodices of dresses, uh, uh, pinning them at the shoulders, or perhaps holding cloaks on the shoulders. It's another interesting piece here. This is actually a medieval um, lead ampulla or pilgrim flask. Um, these contained holy water or holy oil sometimes um, that had been blessed by a priest and that uh, was considered to make them lucky. It meant that God would keep an eye on you. Um, they were sold in vast numbers from some of the major shrines like Canterbury and Walsingham and Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, which is where this one's probably from, because the radiating design on the back of it, on the right-hand side there, is a scallop shell, which was a symbol for Santiago de Compostela, uh, which was the sort of place you might go to if you wanted to make a long pilgrimage, but not go quite as far as Jerusalem. This one was actually found in Gloucestershire, which is a long way from Spain in the medieval period when travel was long and slow and difficult. Um, the loops on the side are actually to hang it up. Um, you could wear it around your neck or you could wear it around your waist. Uh, the fact that it was found in a field um, in Gloucestershire suggests perhaps that whatever someone was wearing it on probably broke and it would have slipped away. Probably quite a devastating loss to someone who was carrying it around hoping it would uh, make their life better. This is a... Um, a rather different date um, from the uh, middle of the 19th century. There's still a time when most people didn't have access to water in their homes or even um, sometimes to a sort of a standpipe even in their village. They would have to get water still in some cases out of rivers or streams or even ponds. Um, this is a token issued by um, the Bishop of St. Asaph's who actually uh, created a water fountain so people could go and get water from that cleaner water from that uh, in the middle of their high street, but only certain people are allowed to get it. So he issued coins, each one had a unique number on it, it's number 45, um, and you couldn't take water unless you'd got one of these coins. Reminds us how only 150 years ago, life was really quite different for a lot of people than it is today. And then there are these, well, this fearsome looking object you can see from the front and the back here. Um, looks like a fish hook or something like that. I wonder if anyone had that as a false explanation. Um, but actually, they're 
medieval, uh, medieval early modern dress fasteners, uh, sort of like a hook and eye, really, just for holding your dress together uh, before we had zips or any way of doing that uh, uh, more easily and indeed more safely. Uh, you can only imagine how many fingers must have got hurt on those sharp hooks trying to pull together a dress, particularly if it was a tight fitting bodice dress. Um, they are quite common finds. We surmise they did quite often wear, wear loose. Um, and perhaps if they were holding a dress that was very tightly fitting to make you look as thin in the uh, middle as possible, maybe they're inclined to be under a bit of strain. And one does wonder whether those hands that are grasping the fitting there are actually alluding to the effort of holding the dress together. So I hope you have fun making up your own false explanations and I hope you enjoyed trying to guess and congratulations if you won, uh, either as the team with the highest number of correct guesses or indeed as the team with the highest number of correct bluffs. Are you good at writing really convincing false stories? The point for some of this really, is that what's absolutely crucial when we're looking at archaeological artefacts is knowing about context. Context is about where things come from. So there's a couple of definitions here. If you Google it, or if you look it up in the Cambridge Dictionary, it's about knowing the situation in which something has been. So for something written down, context is really about knowing who wrote that and why? For archaeology, context is about knowing where something was found and what it was associated with. And without context, it can be really difficult to know what things were and even more to the point what they can tell us, as you've already discovered. So a couple of examples here we can look at together. So at the uh, end of your workbook now, have a look um, at this find. Here it is. Again, write down just a quick note of your first thoughts, really, of what you think it might be. It's out of context right now for you. All you've got is a scale there. So rather like with that very first object we look at, looked at, write down just quickly what you think it might be or what you think it looks like. Okay, having written down what it looks like, I'm now going to give you a bit more context. So here's a description from the excavation report about um, where, the, where the item was found um, and something about its appearance, what it was with, and something about the wear on it as well. So read all of that information through, look at the object, and then write down your interpretation of that object using the contextual, the context information. Have a think about writing a description for it, as if you were writing a label to go into a museum to tell a visitor what it was. That's the information you've got. And that really, to be quite honest, is all the information that the archaeologists had when they found it. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So you've had a few minutes to write your description of this object for a museum visitor. I wonder what you said. And so what archaeologists would say describing this is that the significant thing really is that it was found in a grave that was sufficiently small that it was likely to be an infant under the age probably of uh, 18 months, two years, uh, possibly quite probably under a year old. Um, the survival was very bad, so there wasn't enough skeletal evidence to be able to determine anything else about the person it was buried with. But the fact that it was associated with an infant um, strongly suggests that it was a feeding bottle because it's got a hole. You can see there's a hole at the bottom end as well as the top. And it's shaped a bit like a breast. So it's suggested that it's a feeding bottle for a baby. It 
is just about the right size, you can see from the scale, to fit into the hand you could have held it to nurse a baby sitting on your lap. The teat end, the end with a hole in, is heavily abraded and that shows it's been used. Now that did actually confuse things a little bit because it was so heavily abraded. There was a concern that actually a baby, which would only have had very uh, new teeth, small teeth, if any teeth at all, um, might not have caused that much wear. So perhaps it was actually used for feeding lambs as well, or instead. But the fact that it's been put in a baby's grave does suggest it was for the baby being fed. And that's interesting because it tells us that a baby that couldn't feed properly, and the most common reason for a baby not being able to feed from its mother is that it has a hair lip, it has a, a, a a deformity of the lip, which means it can't form a, a suction around the mother's breast to feed. Um, if the baby's mother had simply been unable to feed, um, then the community would probably have found another babe, another mother who was nursing who could feed that baby as well. And that very commonly happens. So that suggests that this baby was disabled in some way, but was actually cared for sufficiently to be nurtured as much as possible with a special item for someone trying to make sure it had the best possible chance. And of course the fact that we find it in a grave um, shows us that ultimately um, that chance didn't quite work out. <clears throat> so here's another example to look at. Now here's the find in its context. You can see there's a uh, burial here, and the two white arrows are pointing to two wooden staffs that are in that grave. Now again, have a look and just write a quick description of what you can say about those staffs just from looking at the picture there. Just give you a quick minute to do that. Okay, so now you've written your description. I'm going to give you a bit of additional source information because we've got the context we can see that those are in the grave. It's worth knowing as a bit of additional information that artifacts within graves are really quite uncommon in the medieval period. Once we get beyond about the 9th or 10th century uh, artifacts cease being placed in graves in the vast majority of cases. 98% of medieval graves have no artifacts in them at all that we can see, certainly none that have survived. So there's a couple of sources here. There's a prayer or a charm from Exeter Cathedral. And there's a drawing, which probably looks a bit odd, but it's a drawing at the bottom of the page there of a wooden object inscribed with the uh, sort of imploration, the, the plea, if you like, um, uh, for the eyes, Tobias heals the eyes, salve the eyes, full of blood. Um, so have a look at those two sources, have a look at the that find in its context, and again, try and write a description of that object, how you'd explain it, what you think it means, your interpretation of it, and how you'd write that interpretation. If they, those staffs were being displayed in a museum and you wanted to explain them to a visitor. So I'll give you as much time as you need to do that. So, Having had a chance to think about your interpretation, I wonder what you said. What then do the archaeologists think? Well, this is one of a number of the relatively small, only 2% of medieval graves that were subject to quite a big study. Um, and the suggestion has been that these staffs in particular, you look at that that charm, that poem, and it is talking about, I secure myself, I help myself by means of this staff, commend myself to the protection of God against pain, various sorts, um, and great against harm, all the harm that may go into the land. 
I chant a victory chant, I carry a victory staff. There's a sense in that poem that a staff is somehow protective. So we might infer from that that the reason that staff, those two staffs are found in the grave is because the person putting that burial together thought they might protect the person being buried. And we have additional confirmation, perhaps, that that's those staffs, wooden staffs, might have been perceived as having some protective, perhaps even some slightly magic quality about them, from that object at the bottom of the page, where there's that, uh, again, plea uh, for uh, a sort of health, healing-related protection. So we can infer from this that this person or these objects were put in the grave to be some form of protection. Now that's very interesting because this study that was done, the big study that the archaeologists doing this research came to the conclusion about was that there's a belief in, in superstitious magic in the medieval period that is beyond the sort of uh, prayers that were really authorised for the Christian church by that time. You weren't supposed to put objects into graves. But actually, the more closely we look, the more often we find traces of objects. And there's one example we find, which now we've started to recognise it, we see it again and again, which is white stones placed in graves. They're very commonly associated in folklore, which always used to be completely overlooked as being a sort of irrelevant, trivial source of information. But white and white stones are often associated with innocence uh, and with healing. Quartz stones in particular, which are often white, if you bang them together, they will create a strange sort of light. Um, and those quartz pebble, a rounded quartz beach pebble, if you found that excavating a grave, you'd probably just think it was there naturally. There are lots of pebbles in the soil after all. We're starting to suspect there's much more in the way of this sort of magic, folk magic, superstition being practiced than any written text tells us about. Because we don't see this in the prayer books. We don't read about it in the priest's sermons because it's not official practice. It's the sort of good luck, magic that people believed in. And that really tells us something we can't know from any other source about people in the medieval period, in the same way that that baby feeding bottle told us something we couldn't know about child rearing and about the closeness of bond and care that was given to children in periods very, very different to our own. So, I hope that's given you a chance to think about archaeological artefacts, about how we can study them, how we can interrogate them, how we can get misled by them. And more important than anything else, the importance of knowing something about the context of them, about knowing as much as possible about where they came from, what they were found with, what other objects have been found that are similar, what is known about the period they came from, what site they came from, because it's only through putting the object together with where it came from that we can really try and understand things about people's lives that people didn't write down and that haven't come down to us through any other way. And so why do these objects matter? They're fascinating artifacts from the past, some of them beautiful, some of them are intriguing, some of them can be horrifying. They can show us the degree of craftsmanship that existed. But they also show us the complexity of thought that went into people's lives that often isn't written down. So I hope you enjoyed that session of Dig School. And I hope to see you again on another dig school sometime soon. Enjoy.